Good morning, good morning, and thank you all for coming out today and fighting through the messy weather. And I'm telling you, it's, it's worth it all, right? I mean, because you only have to put up with the rain just kind of getting in the car and getting out of the car and just for a couple seconds. And, you know, you're living proof you won't melt. Look to your neighbor and say, hey, you did good getting here and you look great. Just tell them how good they look this morning and they, they need to hear that. And so do you sometimes and so do we. We all do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, my brother. Yes, sir. We are finishing up a study entitled Truth. It was the kickoff study of the new year here, 2021. And, and as we come to the end of this, we've talked about what is truth, truth under attack, uh, know the truth, live the truth. And today we're jumping into the, the aspect of tell the truth. Now, when I say that, some of you automatically go, I'm, I'm good on this. I can go ahead and leave and get to lunch real early or a buffet breakfast or something. And I, I've got that one down because I know that, that being honest is, is, is in the top 10. Amen. How many of you heard of that? Thou shalt not lie. That's, that's one of the biggies. And, and so I'm good at that. Yeah, I struggle a little bit. I know, it, you know, like when my wife asked me how, how the meatloaf is tonight. I have to get a little creative with the truth, so, you know, I just, I work it, you know, to, to not hurt her, but, you know what I'm saying, so I, I'm good on this, Pastor, and that, that's really not the context we're talking about today when we talk about to tell the truth. If you're taking notes, write this down. Every believer is a truth teller. We all have a part to play in preaching the good news to the whole world. Now, I'm sure you realize, like I do, that final words from someone are usually very, very important. When someone is finishing this part of their life off and about to step into eternity, or maybe they're moving far, far away, the other side of the country or the other side of the world, and what, what they say in those parting words are usually super important to those people that they love. And typically, typically they're going to share their deepest parts of their heart and what really matters to them. And, and Jesus is no exception. After his crucifixion, and when he raised from the dead and he gathered his disciples, disciples together and he was preparing to go back to heaven to prepare that place for us that he's working on still right now and you got to believe it's getting real close right tell somebody it's getting close he gathered them together and he gave them some parting instructions that not only are, were for them 2,000 plus years ago but they are for us today as well so sadly all these years later the last words of Jesus have seemingly been forgotten for the most part. Before he sent it into heaven, he left the church one great commission. Can anybody tell me what that is? A smattering of you, as they would say. Great. Realized it's go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Very simple, right? Go everywhere, and you could boil it down to this, go everywhere and preach the good news to everyone. These words are found in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. So knowing that Jesus, before he left, didn't say, don't forget my chicken casserole recipe. Don't forget to always carry an umbrella with you. He didn't say any of that kind of stuff. No, those, those are... Somewhat important, I guess, maybe if you like chicken casserole or, or, or don't want to get wet. But what he said was, go and preach the gospel, the good news, the truth, right? Write that down somewhere. The truth, go and preach it everywhere, everybody. Those were his parting words to us. So I have to ask us as the church, as his disciples, and I'm assuming you are, and I pray that you are, and if you haven't made that decision to follow Christ, to surrender your life, do it now. There's no time like the present, right? Do it now. So I'm, I'm asking us all who follow Christ and call ourselves disciples, how are we doing with the Great Commission? How are we doing with telling the truth to those around us? The truth of the matter is that so many today Christians aren't doing that. 51% of evangelicals in a recent study say they don't understand what the Great Commission is. How many of you know that 51% is just over half? So you take this room, you split it down the middle. This half has no clue. This half knows what it is. Is that scary to you? I mean, we should know these, these things, right? We should know the truth, and the truth will set us free. And here's the beauty of it. When we know the truth and we tell the truth, the truth will set others free as well. But half of us don't seem to know that this is important. 
So where is the disconnect? 64% of Bible-minded evangelicals have forgotten the meaning of this all-important command. 49% still know it, kind of, know what it is, but 64% of Bible-minded evangelicals have forgotten the meanings of this all-important command. The truth is obvious more than ever. We need to recover the meaning, the true meaning of Jesus' mission, and find out what our part in it is. So we're going to unpack over the next few moments what it means to do all we can to help accomplish the Great Commission, to preach the gospel to every person everywhere. In Revelation 7 verse 9, God reveals the grand finale of human history. When humanity's struggle finally ends, and man, I'm telling you, I can't wait for that, right? The stuff we deal with now, the the craziness of this world, I'm ready for it to be over and for us to be home with the Lord. But there's still work to do. It's coming quickly. God's going to fill his eternal kingdom with a great multitude which no one could count, as Revelation 7, 9 says, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. So that's the end. That's what it looks like. There's going to be this mass of people that come from every corner of the globe that are going to be and belong to Christ Jesus. That's what it's gonna, gonna, gonna look like when we get to that day. You're gonna look around, you're gonna see more than just a few hundred people here that you do church with at Connections in Belmont. More than just a few, few thousand people that you are connected to in this area that you live in, you're gonna see a mass of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. All worshiping Jesus. All belonging to him. What this tells us in Revelation 7, 9 is that God is preparing a glorious inheritance for his son Jesus. An uncountable multitude of perfectly forgiven, wholly devoted worshipers from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we must not merely sit back as spectators and wait for this to happen. No, that's not our assignment. That's not our mission, if you will. But God tells us to work with him in making that happen in 2 Corinthians 6.1. Again, in Mark 16.15, Jesus commands us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to whom? All creation. Every person we can. Many today are deathly afraid of proclaiming the gospel. We're glad to quietly live it out in our lives, but boldly proclaim it? No, no, no not me. That's it's just not who I am just not my personality that's just not my makeup that's that's uh, you know it's just not me according to barna listen to this almost half of practicing christian millennials 47 percent agree at least somewhat that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith as you did did y'all hear that Almost half of younger Christ followers feel like that it's it's just not right. It just we 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 shouldn't try to push our beliefs on onto other people. Is that anywhere close to what Jesus told us? When I when I was a youth pastor like a thousand years ago, it seems like, and yeah, it's it's it, it flies by. We used to play this game where we'd circle all of our youth group up. And at that time, we probably had 50, 60, 70 kids on a given Wednesday night. Sometimes we'd hit 100 kids on a Wednesday night. And we'd circle them up in a big circle of chairs. And we would start by whispering in the ear of one of the students some statement, some saying. And they would have to pass it to the next one, whisper it in there, whisper it in there, whisper it in there. And we would just kind of want to see what came back all the way around the circle to the final person, how different it was. And 99% of the time, it was something completely different than what we started with. Jesus tells us to go. He tells us to preach. And yet here today, 2021, almost half of young believers say that is wrong. Well, I want you to know this morning, Jesus did not stutter when he gave the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. Missionary Hudson Taylor said the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. If we would be Jesus' disciples, we must go and preach the only message of salvation, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the truth of God's Word. That is our message to the masses. 
But we're not merely called to preach to the same nations over and over again. No, God's love is expansive and universal. He loves the whole world. Therefore, Jesus calls us to reach out to every person and people group with the message of truth of his salvation and his glorious good news. Now, I'm not necessarily making a push for foreign missions to us this morning, although I am doing that somewhat in the sense that if God has put it on your heart to go, if God has put it on your heart to support, if God has put it on your heart to somehow be a part of reaching those in other nations, then yes, by all means, you better get up and you better get at it, right? That's what God has for your life in that specific way. He has that for all of us to be a part somehow of reaching the masses, whether it's support financially, prayerfully, partnering from a distance, going on short-term trips, or being there permanently with our lives every single day, day in and day out, and ingrained in that country or that place. But what I am saying is that unfortunately most of today's Christians have trouble going across the street or across the office to tell God's beautiful truth to someone who is dying to hear it. Church, it's time that we wake up, that we all wake up and be truth tellers, that every single one of us gets consumed like the old prophet said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I grow weary of holding it back and I can't do that any longer. I've got to tell somebody. That's what Christ followers are to be about. So instead of talking about the latest football stuff or the latest baseball stuff or the latest weather stuff or the latest whatever stuff in the community, we talk about Jesus first and foremost. We make sure that everybody knows that he is alive and well and he loves us and he's the only one that can save us. We get consumed with that. Now all this information I just share with you tells us a couple of things that, that far too many in today's church are sadly proclaiming verbally that they are disowning the mission. They, they are deceived terribly. The Bible says, how shall they hear without a what? A preacher. Come on, church. Know the truth. You see, before, sadly, so much of the church disowned the mission non-verbally. And what I mean by that is that, that so many, for different reasons, chose not to tell the truth to those dying to hear it through, through the years. I mean, they wouldn't come out and say, I believe it's wrong to force my faith on somebody else. But, but by their actions and their lifestyle, the church has been asleep for far too long when it comes to evangelism and fulfilling the Great Commission. All of us. We wouldn't come out and say it in those words. But we say it with how we live. Some because they didn't feel like it was their job. Not my job. I don't get paid to tell people about Jesus. It's for the paid preachers and the evangelists. It's their job. Others seem to not understand the urgency of the hour. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking just about the apocalyptic calendar. We know. We know Jesus is coming back soon. Got to. All the signs are there. They've all been fulfilled. I mean, everything's just in order. We're just waiting on God the Father to let Jesus know it's time. Go get our children. I'm not just talking about that. But what I'm talking about is, is this. And I don't mean to throw out here any kind of fear or anything. Any, you know, I, I'm letting us know what reality is because we all know how this plays out. That who you might be hanging out with today or tomorrow afternoon, they might not be here the next day. Why? Because that's the way life goes. We don't know what's going to happen. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow that life is but a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. It goes by that quickly. So, what's important to us? To share with those that we are around, that we love. That we might not have another opportunity to do so. It doesn't matter their age or stage of life. Here's the reality of it. God is saying to us that the time is now. Get the urgency in your life. Know, what's going on. know how you're living. And what's important, so many don't understand the urgency. And then one more reason I want to give you is I believe so many Christ followers have chosen not to tell the truth of God's great salvation is because they feel like they're not qualified to do so. <laughs> what a lie. What a tragedy. When he comes into our lives upon our invitation and changes us, we are instantly qualified to tell the truth. And here's, here's what I'm talking about. Come and meet a man who changed my entire life. 
You remember the woman that Jesus encountered that nobody else wanted to have anything to do with at the well? That she had been married so many times that she was a, a laughing stock in the community and she had to go to the well by herself at, at, at the noonday hour so nobody would be there to ridicule and scorn her and, and make fun of her and all that stuff. And, and Jesus happened to be there that day. He just happened to be there. Don't you like those just happened times when, when God just shows up? And God read her mail to her out of love, not out of condemnation, and changed her life. And instantly, guess what happened? She went through the city that she was once hiding from and and said, come and, man. come and meet somebody that changed my life, that loved me for who I am and has changed who I am because of that love. So whenever we say yes to Christ, we are instantly qualified to share who he is to us and how he is working in us to those around us. Church, that's, that's evangelism. You don't have to go, you don't have to, go to seminary. I'm not against it, but here's what I'm saying. When Jesus comes in, we are automatically qualified to tell the truth. The gospel changed me through Jesus Christ, and he'll do the same for you. So don't let the enemy talk you out. Talk you out. Of your qualification. You are more than qualified. Now let me quickly give you some reasons to be truth tellers that, that we know from God's word. Number one is simply because God made us to know him. We were made to be in relationship with him. That's how all of this is, is put together. Human beings are unique. God made us in his image. We have a spirit which means we can communicate with God. The Bible tells us even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be, be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him, Ephesians 1, 4. And God wants a long-term relationship with us. People who do not know God miss the very point for which he put them on this planet. And how tragic is that? It's called purpose. Our purpose is to know God intimately. Hey, Jordan. Um, hey. Thank you, guys. Secondly, evangelism was Jesus' mission, and we are called to do likewise. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus' mission is to seek and save what? Turtles? The whales? The environment? We've got we to go green. We've got to save our planet. This planet's gone. It's doomed. The Bible says heaven and earth is going to fall away, but my word, the truth, is going to last forever. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, church. So don't worry about saving the planet. Use those plastic straws all you want. <laughs> Throw them in the trash can. Now, by all means, I'm not saying we just go littering. That's terrible. But he said, my mission, my mandate is to seek and save lost people. Because we were created to be like Christ, our mission should be the exact same as his. In fact, in John 17, 18, Jesus spells this out even more specifically. He says, in the same way that you gave me, Father, a mission in this world, I give my disciples a mission in this world. What you've given to me, Heavenly Father, I give to them, right? And that includes you. It wasn't just those original disciples there before he left to go to heaven. No, it includes all of us who call on the name of Christ Jesus. Evangelism is his mission. It's our mission. It's also our responsibility. The Bible says, when I tell wicked people that they will die because of their sins, you must warn them to turn from their sinful ways so they won't be punished. If you refuse, you are responsible for their death. Wow. That's Ezekiel 3.18. Man, that's a powerful smack you in the face kind of wake up mandate, right? It's our responsibility. God makes it clear that if people around us are headed for hell and we don't share the gospel with them, that's on our hands. Man, how sobering is that? People are in our lives for a reason. If we don't tell them about Jesus and they spend an eternity away from God, that's on them, but it's on us too in some ways. Number four, evangelism is a privilege. 2 Corinthians 5.20 reminds us that we have the privilege of being Christ's ambassadors. We have the opportunity to represent the king of kings to the people in our lives. It's a privilege to serve as an ambassador for the government, but it's a much, much greater privilege to represent the creator of the universe to our friends and family and neighbors and everybody we come into contact with. Number five, sharing our faith, telling the truth shows your gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. 
Too many times we forget what the good news really is. The Bible tells us at the time you were without Christ, you had no hope and were in the world without God. But thanks be to God, he came and rescued us from that. You, what, what, what seems to happen, and this goes for every Christian. And that's why David prayed the prayer, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Because here's what seems to happen with Christ followers. Man, when we cross that line of faith and say yes to Jesus, we just consume. We're just overwhelmed. We're just amazed. We're just in this whoo euphoria. But as time goes on and life ticks away, we find ourselves caught up in the stuff of life. and That fire that once burned bright, as Steve Camp saying years ago, we've let it grow dim. And the next thing you know, yeah, we love Jesus, you know. Whew, we go to church. And, but it's not that. He saved me. I was dead in my sins and he saved me. He came. As we sang a few moments ago. I knew that he would come. He always shows up. He loves me that much. We lose that fire. And we, we can't afford to do that. Because without him we have no hope. But with him we have all hope. And we need to see everybody in that same light that they desperately need Jesus. Because that's the next thing. People are hopelessly lost without Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that Jesus is the only one who can save us. People are lost without him. He is the only way for people to get to heaven. God could have written the good news in the sky. But instead he has chosen to share it through us. Billions around the world and in our neighborhoods need to hear it. And if we don't share it, I ask you this question right now. Who will? Who will share the truth? Who will tell it to the people in our lives? Because sadly, a lot of the people that you know and love and do life with will never come to this church. They never, never will click onto the live stream. They won't hit, get to hear the preaching of Pastor Scott, Pastor Robert, Pastor Joseph. No, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying is... They want to be engaged with us to hear the truth. But they will, however, be engaged with you. Maybe once a week, maybe every day. You will have interaction with them. You will have, look at me, church, opportunity to tell them the truth in love, as the Bible says. So... Are we doing that because people are dying to hear the truth and to know the truth? And then lastly, God wants everyone saved. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that God does not want anyone to be lost. That means this church that we will never look at anyone whom God doesn't want to save. No matter how good of a person they are or no matter how bad of a person we, we categorize them to be. Every single one of those and everyone in between, God loves and does not want them to be lost. No one is too forgotten. No one is too far from God. If God wants every person to be saved, then here's the bottom line of it, church. We should too. Yes, even that person that you can't stand, <laughs> that you've had some issues with, that you would just rather not spend eternity with them, okay? Everybody else, but, but not them, Lord. You understand. I mean, you know how they are. God loves them. It breaks his heart if they are lost and apart from him. And it should ours too as much as we kind of have issues with them. Like Pastor Scott challenged us last week. You want to really love your neighbor? You go out and do it in action. Put feet to that. Bring it to life. God wants everyone saved. As we close our time together this morning, there's a beautiful story found in the Old Testament about Telling others the truth. In 2 Kings 6 and 7, Samaria is in a terrible famine and terrible oppression by the Syrian army and king and vast army uh, that, that they have. And Elisha is being blamed by the king and, and, and of his people. And God speaks to Elisha and tells him that in a day. Now, now this, this famine was so, so bad that people are literally 
cannibalizing, which means they're eating other people. They are so desperate and starving for food. That's how bad of a famine it is. You you feel a little cranky if you don't eat in three hours. I mean, you know, go through like, you know, three months of not eating. So all this is happening, and they're blaming Elisha, and he tells the king, he says, he gets a word from God. He says, hey, guess what? This time tomorrow, there's going to be more flour and more barley and more supplies than you can imagine. It's going to be sold cheap out on the streets tomorrow. And all of them in the king's court laughing at him. And one guy says, man, that ain't, that's impossible. I mean, we've been in this famine for, for months now, and everybody's just dying because of starvation. And, and you're saying that in one day? Fast forward. There's four lepers. Anybody know about lepers, leprosy? Disease where like your body parts just start falling off. And, and whenever you're diagnosed with that in these days and times, because there was no help, no cure, guess what happens to you? You're outcast. You got, you got to go. We don't want to catch that. Put your mask on. Put four masks on. Wrap your whole body in mask. I, you, you can't be around us. Sorry, couldn't help it. <laughs> and so they're out here outside the city walls dying of starvation too. The whole, the whole city's dying of starvation. And all of a sudden, they, they, they think to themselves, you know, the Syrian army, I mean, the Syrian people, we could walk down to their area. We could try to go to their city and see if, if somebody might have some mercy on us, of us lepers, and, and give us a little bit of something to eat because they, they've got things pretty good in their area. And they, they reason to themselves, if we stay here, we're going to die, Right? I mean, we're starving to death along with the people in the city that, that we love. And if we go there, there's a chance that they could kill us because we're not of their people. But it's a chance we're willing to take. So they march down towards this Syrian city. And something strange happens when they get there. That there is not a single person to be found in the whole encampment. It's totally empty. But the crazy thing is, is, is it's empty, but it's like people just left. And when they left, I mean, they got up and left and didn't do anything about what was happening at the moment. To the point that, that like, when, when a pot of stew is over here still cooking on, on a fire. And the fire's still going. These people were here just a moment ago. And whatever reason, they're all, I'm talking millions of people, gone in an instant. Food prepared, food everywhere, treasures, unbelievable jewelry and, 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 and precious stones and everything of their, their possessions left behind. You know, when you're leaving on a trip, usually you pack and get ready and take the important things with you. They no, doesn't look like anybody took anything. And they walk into this, these four lepers. And they find it. What they didn't realize is that God had called this great sound to befall the Syrian encampment. That made them think there was this mighty attack of a great army that was going to come and destroy them. And when they heard those mighty rumblings, literally they just took off running. They didn't take anything. They didn't grab the stew that was cooking. They didn't get their jewelry or their prized possessions or anything. They just left with the shirts on their back, so to speak, or the robes. I guess they didn't really wear shirts back then. I don't know. And so when these four lepers come, this is what they find. Everything they have need of for life. So what, what would you do? You haven't eaten in probably weeks. Stew cooking, bread cooking, fresh. Some of it wrapped up for tomorrow. You walk into that, nobody's around. As far as the eye can see, there's houses Tents, food, treasures, everything, everything that's been left behind. What would you do? You're hungry. What would you do? <laughs> you better believe it. I would sit down and start grubbing like I haven't eaten in, in days, like which they haven't, and they did. And as they were getting started, just filling them their bellies with, with, with this good food. I mean, I'm, I imagine it's probably the best food they ever ate since they hadn't ate in, in days and weeks and months probably. All of a sudden, it hit them. And, and listen to what they basically said. This is not right. Our city is starving, and we are feasting. 
they are cannibalizing people. And we've become millionaires instantly. We've got to go back and tell them the truth. What a picture of us. In Jesus Christ, we have found all the riches that we would ever need. Not only for this lifetime, but for eternity. How are we doing with telling everybody else we come in contact with the beautiful, glorious truth? Of Jesus our treasure. They ran back. To their people. And told them come. And feast with us. There's more food than we could eat in a lifetime. Come and join us. Come and. Be saved. Come and find life. And I mean they ran back with excitement. And and listen. These are the same people that that put them out of the city because of their leprosy. (laughs) But they didn't let that stop them. They didn't hold a grudge. They didn't keep that against them. No, they ran back to those very people and said, come and find life. Come and find hope. Come and find the answers. We've got it over here. We found it. And we want you to share in our glorious find. That's truth telling. At its very best. If you would close your eyes with me for a moment. Whether you realize it or not when you walked into here. We are all messengers. We are all proclaimers and preachers and truth tellers. How shall they know without a preacher? Without you and me. All of us. Tell the truth. You'll be amazed at what God can do through a willing, available vessel. My prayer, my my push, my encouragement is for every one of us, both in this room and watching right now, be that vessel. Charles Spurgeon, great preacher of many years ago, said these words, and man, they just get in you if you'll if you'll let them. He said, He said, I will never, I will never stop speaking about Jesus. Not now, not ever. And after I die. They will speak about me speaking about Jesus. Don't you love that? Never going to stop. And my legacy will continue on even when I'm I'm at home. I'm with him. They're going to speak about me speaking about Jesus that I would not shut my mouth. I would not stop. And they couldn't stop me. Wow. Wow. God, let that be us. Let that be our anthem. Let that be our prayer. Let that be our lifestyle. Let us let us get to this place with the help of the Holy Spirit that that we're so consumed with you that that the first priority, the first thing that we wonder about whenever we rub shoulders with somebody is, do they know you personally? Are they saved? And as I've said a thousand times before, we're not the people that shove it down your throat because that just doesn't work. But we're the people that lovingly say, hey, come and meet a man. Hey, come and meet this man who changed my life. This Savior who came for me and he came for you too. Come and find joy. Come and find hope. Come and find peace. Come and find life. Come and find everything you need. That's the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Jesus Christ if you're in this room right now if you're watching right now and you would honestly say I need the fire of the Holy Spirit to come and ignite my heart to be a truth teller I want to be that person I want to be that preacher that proclaimer that one that shares beautifully the words of life the truth I don't want to see your hand raised I don't want to see anything other than you just standing where you're at right now if you say pastor I hear clearly and I understand clearly today what is being mandated and and, and called 
upon our lives, upon my life, and I respond by saying yes. How many others would stand with these and say, don't forget about me. I need to tell everybody to go into every part of the world that I can and tell everyone I can the good news of Jesus Christ and his great salvation. As you're standing right now, would you just lift your hands up to the, to the, to the sky and, and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I ask you to come and fill me. I ask you to ignite my heart. Bring back the joy of my salvation, God. Let it be that fire shut up in my bones that I can't contain. I don't want to contain it. I want to tell somebody. I want to give away the gospel. I want to be a truth teller. I want that to be priority one in my life. That when I meet somebody, rub shoulders with somebody, the first thing I think about is, do they know you, Jesus? And the second thing that happens is, I share your love with them. Father, help us. Be those people. Help us be those disciples that carry out the Great Commission and not just have, have no clue about what it is, God, but we know what it is because it is your mission to seek and save the lost, and it's got to be ours as well. There's a truth that we know. That is the truth of God's word. That Jesus came and was the living truth and is the living truth. And that truth is shut up in our lives, and we want to get it out to everyone we can. As we continue to know the truth and grow in the truth, we want to give the truth. We want to tell the truth. Help us to accomplish that, Lord. And as we worship you one more time in song right now, God, let that be our closing to this prayer that we celebrate you and honor you and allow you to do this great work in us and through us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.